verse 42. I'll read it. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And here's the key verse, 45. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, <clears throat> the next part, starting in verse 46, is, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food and with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And we remember for sure that that last verse we always talk about how the church was growing at that time and why. Um, Jesus, in Luke 6, verse 30, and I'm going to give you two versions of it because the wording is different. In the NIV, in Luke 6, 30, it says, Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. In 6.30 in the uh, ESV version, it says, give to everyone who begs from you and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. So I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand or confess or go for come forward or anything, but when you are driving around town, <coughs> I remember one time Nora and I went to Mississippi and the hotel was here and there was a highway and between the hotel and the highway, there were a lot of homeless people. And we both thought it, Nora said it, so again, it's her fault. <coughs> she said, this is scary. I don't like that. They're I don't like those homeless people either. How many of you have ever walked down a dark street or been in a city? We went to Seattle and they were all sleeping on the sidewalks. You've been to those situations? How many of you stopped to help them? Okay. <laughs> I see one shaking their head now, the other just saying, I'm not committing to this thing. It's embarrassing. We all do that. Why? It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it I've is. heard cop out answers before. <laughs> I think it is, I think it is complicated it. because in maybe a different time, different world, I don't know, just I think we're so um, attuned now to violence and being unsure of situations that we just, it's its just hard for some people, especially old ladies, to, <laughs> to trust. Pardon? Trust. Yes. Well, maybe, yeah, I'll trust, I guess. Maybe. Uh, yeah, for do, we worry, do we ever worry about it? If we did give them money, what they would do with it? <laughs> yeah. Do we make more assumptions things. about what they would do with it? For our society, it's not normal. That's it's not safe. It's not it's not normal. To what? Give them to have homeless people beside um, the road. There's safety yeah. concerns. There's lots of concerns that way. Oh, there must be mental illness, or there must be something wrong with them. So it's just it's not Jesus, normal for our society. So yeah. So when Jesus said that we're supposed to give to people who are begging, mm -hmm. it's different for him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Probably another thing that raises its ugly head is uh, the struggle when you see that situation, the struggle you have of am I willing to commit the time and resources to help somebody in that group? Uh, and usually the answer is, is no. I don't want to get involved. I, I can't help them all, so I can't. There's no need in helping one. But uh, that's that's another struggle that comes into our minds. Is, 
do I have the time? Do I have the resources to commit to helping? However far this help has to go, and usually the answer is no. You want to be a good Samaritan without effort. <laughs> without what? Without what? effort. Oh, effort. Um, <clears throat> don't don't um, don't think that I'm standing up here trying to be perfect and, and point at you. I mean, it goes both by it is a cultural thing. And that's part of what this class is about, is looking at the, at the culture and why we we tend to take some scripture and we say, yeah, this is a good one. But then we take others and, well, that's, no, that doesn't apply because that was then and this is now. And we, we tend to take them and separate them. Um, sometimes we, we pull... Um, scripture out to uh, justify our actions um again i'm going to point to second thessalonians chapter 3 verse 10 chapter 3 verse 10 in the niv it says for even when we were with you we gave you this rule the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat in 2 Thessalonians, the ESV version, it says, for even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. And that's a good one because we're assuming they're not working. And the Bible says if they're not working, if they're not willing to work, then they shouldn't eat. I'm not going to give them my money since they're not willing to eat. And so we tend to say this is a good scripture because it justifies our thoughts that we have which contradict by the way the very thing that jesus said we're not supposed to do um so when when paul and the other writers were talking to the, the corinthians and the people when he was writing to Timothy, when he was writing to the when all those letters were being written. <clears throat> what, what happened? Why in that scripture in Acts, why were they having to distribute their possessions and sell things and give to those as they had need? What was going on culturally, since we bring that up for our sake here? What was happening to those people? Not for sure, but I'm assuming it wasn't a very profitable thing to be a Christian. So if you had something, you were doing pretty good. So those that didn't have something to sell off, didn't have property, land, whatever, they were stuck with no jobs, being ostracized. Just find out, I guess. And then, at that, this point, weren't they all gathered for consent for Pentecost in Acts two? So they weren't home or going to live in any way. They were. All gathered together. I mean, that was that is part of it, and that's part of it. But generally, in those countries at the time, a lot of them had the option to have jobs. But here's what happened culturally: they were so impressed with this message of Jesus, with what was going on with Jesus' second coming. He's going to come back that they did quit their jobs and they were waiting anxiously because it was going to happen. Everything that they were told was Jesus has made himself present because he's coming back and they thought he was coming back like now, you know, he wasn't just coming back sometime. Um, I may be jumping into a place where I maybe shouldn't go, but have you ever thought about Jesus coming? When do you expect it? How many of you, how many of you have said, my great grandparents said Jesus is coming, we need to be prepared. My grandparents, my parents, how many thousand years? Have we been waiting for Jesus to come? 
And so how many of you sit around and say, it's tomorrow. He's coming soon. We need to be ready now. I'll bet none of you. Forget going to the simple supermarket. <laughs> Don't even plan on the Super Bowl because that's too far away. Right? So we don't do that. We, we have developed a, a thought process that says, yes, it's going to happen, but we've been waiting 2,000 years. Maybe it's going to be longer and we have time. Um, how many of you know who Abraham Maslow is? He was an edu educator, right? Educator. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Okay. Let me see. Okay. <laughs> we have an educated audience. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Maslow told this story once, and I'm going to shorten it. But he says, suppose <clears throat> this man, put yourself in his place walks up and he's getting ready to greet a friend of his. And as he gets close to the friend, the friend hauls off and pops him right in the nose, knocks him down on the ground. And he tries to get up and he hits him again and he falls down again. And as he's trying to get up, he kicks him. And this goes on for 10 or 15 times. And every time he tries to get up, he's pummeled, he's kicked, he's punched. And what do you think happens to his state of being? Now he's probably at a point after being hit that many times and he's been beaten down so many times that he says, it doesn't even matter what he does to me anymore. I just want it to end. That is when people fall into apathy. Now on an educational level, if the kid tries something and he fails, kid tries and made fun of, kid tries and fails and fails and fails and fails and fails. He reaches one where he says, why should I even try? And they don't. If, you, if you're a teacher, you know, you've been there. Now, doesn't that happen with people in life? One thing after another, hits them and beats them. And it's like a never ending thing for years. All they have is I'm getting beat up here. This life is killing me. And you develop a sense of apathy. And you just never longer, no longer care. What happens when you're that tired, when you're that beat up and it happens that much and you develop that apathy with your relationship with God. Isn't it easy to say, where are you? Why is this happening to me? And so we look at those things and we say, um, it's very difficult for us in those situations to start talking about uh, virtues and vices. And that's where I'm going to take you today. Um, in, I'm going to try some more. We have some, uh, give you some examples. We call some things virtues and some things vices. What's a penny saved is a penny earned. What's that teaching? Virtue. Well, saving money. Saving money, frugality. It's a virtue. Mm -hmm. that early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. We know it's not biblical. It's a Ben Franklin thing. Mm -hmm. But what's the virtue that's being taught? Rest. Rest. Well, about hard. Put the work in. Get up early. Get up work. so you can work. Mm -hmm. Get your full day in. One more. A stitch in time saves nine. Hard work. Well, not, sometimes, well, hard work. 
But how about taking care of your possessions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a coat right now, a leather coat that has a split here. We're trying to figure out what to do with it. When I first saw the hole here, had I sewed it, we wouldn't have the whole split now. And so there is a, a thing about taking care of your, your stuff. How about this one? God helps those who help themselves. What's that? Teach? First of all, is it biblical? Uh, it's not even in the Bible, but we seem to think that it is. A lot of people do. I mean, like the verse we just read, that's more or less what it said, right? Here's the verse that it comes from. It comes from Psalm 91, verse 15. And it says, God helps those who rely on him. And we've taken that and twisted it and made it a personal thing. If you help yourself, and they've taken the, we, the culture has taken God out of the scriptures so that it's something that we can do for ourselves. We've internalized it. It's a self reliance thing. Is that, yeah. is that, is that thought across cultures or is that significantly Western? Um, I mean, I think about I think the pull yourself up by your own bootstraps thing. I think it's a, a Western thought. I don't. I don't know. I obviously haven't lived in the Middle East, so I can't say that for sure. Um, things, our our media, and our culture. And I hope I paint this picture correctly. Um, when I was in Thailand. <clears throat> When I, whenever I ran into the rural people in Thailand, many times their mouths were bright red and they had red dripping. And I thought, wow, who beat them up? But I saw so many of them and I asked what it was. Do you, anybody know? They eat raw meat. No, it's some kind of vine or something. It's a thing called betel nut, B E T E L, betel nut. And betel nut in large doses is enough to kill you. But you can take the leaves of the betel nut or small portions of the betel nut, and when you chew on it, it turns red. When it mixes with your saliva, it turns red. And I thought, wow, that's something else. But then when the next day, they wouldn't be chewing the beetle nut. And they would say, the hello is sawadika or sawadika, depending on the male or female. And they would smile. And I'd go, ooh, <laughs> you did get beat up. You got some teeth missing. Now, think about it. Have you seen pictures? Have you seen people from like the... Uh, other countries, poorer countries that don't have dental care? Do they have all their teeth? Are they lined up like chiclets? Oh, <laughs> perfect and everything? No. The odds are, especially in the Middle Ages and even before that, what did they do if they had a bad tooth? <laughs> so many people were very toothless. Now I'm going to ask you to think about this. What are the odds? And don't tell me because he was God that he had perfect teeth. What are the odds of Jesus when we see as if he had perfect teeth? Because of the time that he lived and where he lived. Something about it. Assuming he has a form in heaven like he does did here on earth well i'm just well, okay. <laughs> no, no. i was Here's trying to get you to yeah get when he now. returns <laughs> how do we how do we picture okay jesus now yeah, he's not toothless in the passion of christ or the chosen or whatever no he isn't and um it's hard to imagine jesus not having perfect teeth in fact he's usually slender fit 
good looking, perfect teeth, you know, the whole thing. And that's a cultural thing that probably isn't even physically accurate, um, just, just by observation. Um, sometimes we, we don't, we have to prioritize our virtues and our vices. Um, I'm going to tell you something that I never actually thought about. <clears throat> Most um, in the scriptures, when we talk about virtues and vices, when Paul lists things, we're going to look at some here in a minute. He usually has a list of things, and then there's like a period, and then there's another thing after it. I'll give you an example here in a minute. In that time, the writing style would be to make a list of three or four or five things. And the, the fifth thing was a sum, summation of those other four. Now, our preachers do something similar. They'll have three except for the long-winded ones like Dale, who will have five <laughs> or six points. With subs, <laughs> with sub points. <laughs> he always has points. Mm -hmm. And they, they do that. It's a, it's a stylistic thing that we do with our preparation, our speeches, and, and uh, making lists and things like that. Um, if you will, turn to Colossians chapter three. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. In the ESV version, somebody want to read theirs? Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Okay. We usually say idolatry is a separate thing, but that's the summation of that. Mm -hmm. And we don't generally look at that and say, oh, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. There's our five. And then he has the summation. If you're involved in those things, that, all of that, is idolatry. Does that make sense? Let's look at another one. Um, oh, by the way, if you get down to verse eight and nine, uh, right after that, I hope it's still there. In eight and nine, he does a list too. And he says, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth, period. Do not lie to one another. Now, <clears throat> seeing that you have put off your old self and its practices, there's two things that he's telling you that you have to, just like our baptism, you know, you take off the old man and put on the new. And it's the same way. He wants them to take off these bad things that they're doing and put on good things. But look at the list there. Why would he say, do not lie to one another? as a summary with those things. If you think about situations, when you're angry, you're not going to say things that you don't want to say. Wrath, slander for sure is lying. All of those things are going to fall under, under that category. I think you're are you saying, yeah, but no, I was just trying to read your eyes. So. I apologize. <clears throat> and I wasn't lying. <laughs> okay. Now, <clears throat> um, when we look at these lists, and there, and there are several in, throughout the New Testament, um, 
But he, the letters to Timothy and Titus are, are examples, but here in Colossians, we have those. Um, it, it wasn't that Paul could only think of five, is why he made the list. It's not some sort of a special number. Five of the virtues and five of the vices add up to the Ten Commandments. You know, it's, it's not like he's trying to make some symbolic thing here. Um, the lists weren't meant to be exhaustive. You know, there, there's just too many things that he could have written about. But those things, why would he write about those particular things? Put that in that, that verses. It's not a hard question. He's writing letters to people. That's what they were doing. That's the problem they had. And he's telling them to avoid that. Now, we could take the rest of the 20 minutes that I have left. And we can sit and look at Greenlawn and say, let's make a list of all the virtues and the vices that Greenlawn exemplifies. We might not like the answer. Maybe we will. Um, <clears throat> we, have a, we have several problems with those lists. Number one, our first tendency, what do we do with lists when we have things like this? When we have a list of sins, what do we do with them? Memorize them. Categorize them. Categorize them. These are the really bad. Yeah. These, are, these are the least of them. Exactly. Look at one and say, ooh, I don't do that, so I'm okay. I don't do that one. Ooh, but look, I do do these. So, and we, we categorize them and we try and put them in order. Um, let's consider the case of, uh, we use Dale for out of. <laughs> um, when was the last time we heard of a minister? Or would we fire, would we fire Dale for mishandling fin financial details? Probably. Would we file him for sexual immorality? Probably. Would we file him? In fact, when was the last time you heard of any preacher being fired for gluttony? But aren't they the same? Isn't that what we say, that all sins are sins? But in America, we don't want to do that because that finger can point a lot of different directions. What about pride? Is pride something sinful? Do not raise your hand. If they were prideful, would we fire you? Okay. Think about it. It's part of that vice virtue thing. We tend to pick our vices and our virtues and we separate them into categories. Um, there's another tendency that we do. Turn to Colossians uh, 3.12. This is another list. It says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, one, kindness, two, humility, three, meekness, four, patience, five, and then bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so that you also must forgive, and above all those, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So, out of that list, he's listing virtues. Is there a summary? Love. love. He's summarizing the love, but that love encompasses each and every one of those other virtues. You can't do those others without love. And so um, we do 
We don't want to live by a list of do's and don'ts. What it comes down to is this. Uh, turn to Psalm 101. We'll look at verses 2 and 3. While you're looking there, we tend to only um, really pay attention to or value a virtue when it seems to be, um, the best word I can think of is spontaneous. Have you ever run into somebody and, and they're genuinely acting like they love you? And then you run into other people who act like they love you, and you know, you just know they're fake. Right? I mean, if you've ever been in high school, you know. <laughs> or junior high. We want the we want the virtues that we read in the Bible to be something that is real and genuine. It's not something put on. It's not something, let's see, in this situation, I should be humble. You know, it, we don't want it to be an act. We want it to be something that's there. And how do we do that? Now we look at the psalm. What does the psalmist say? I will ponder the way that is blameless. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. Um, what's he describing there? The way he needs to live his life. And, he, and he's saying, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm trying to do. Um, you mentioned self-sufficiency being just a Western kind of well, thing. I, question. Yeah, the question. Yeah. And um, how about, would procrastination be considered a vice? Stepping on toes now. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> it kind of depends on what you're procrastinating. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> How about plagiarism? <clears throat> you're an English teacher. That's <laughs> lying. That's, that's, that's where the word egregious was invented. I mean, that is like super over the top bad. Can you think of others that might be a list of vices, but there's nothing explicit about them in the Bible? At least think about it anyway, because there are. We have things in our society that we think are wrong, and we would say they're vices, but the Bible doesn't explicitly pull out procrastination or cheating like that. Um, let me ask you, give you a shot at this. Those of, you, those of you who were teachers, married to teachers, or if you were ever in a class, I remember my son coming home one time and said, I'll give, if you'll give me, uh, can I have $50? He said, why? He said, because I have to work in a group. And I know if I want an A, I have to pay them off to not be in the group, <laughs> right? Yeah. If you've ever had to work in a group, you know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> okay. So some kids get together for some group work, or even during a test, you find out that they're sharing answers. Is that wrong? Yes. Mm -hmm. What if they tell you, the Bible tells us to help those who are in need. <laughs> <laughs> they were in need. What? That's not a need. That's not a need. There's a time and a place. <laughs> <laughs> now, they're being honest. We were helping them because they didn't know it. 
They had a need to know it, and I was helping them. They're, they were they fessed up. They're honest. Does that carry any weight? Mm -hmm. It doesn't so make it not wrong. It still doesn't change the consequences. Okay. And then the solution to that probably would be, okay, now you tell me how we're going to determine the grades, or either you're all going to get an F or whatever, mm -hmm. or you're all going to get the lowest grade among the group or whatever. Okay. We, we take time to... Um, run across things like that and we, we say no that's not right but other cultures they will help each other mm -hmm. and even in business now in business models it used to boy i'm going to waste some time on this <clears throat> why when you were in school did all of the teachers all the classes have rows you know why and they'd always say, eyes on your own work. Mm -hmm. so keep your eyes straight so ahead. So they can walk between them. Yeah. Why? To keep you honest, even to you. No. <laughs> it all came from the, uh, the what revolution is it? In Henry, the industrial revolution. revolution. I get, for some reason, Cuba came into my mind. Okay. <laughs> industrial revolution. Henry Ford started what? Assembly lines. assembly lines and what did henry ford want he was going to give you a screw and point to a hole and say every time you see that hole you put a screw in it don't you care what he's doing with that wing nut don't you care what he's doing with that bolt you just put your screw in there and that's all you need to know keep your eyes ahead don't worry about them and we trained them now for us say you're in a modern school do we still have the rows going like that? What do we have? Groups. Groups. You know why? Because in industry, they work in groups. Now, across the world, people work in groups. Why would it be wrong to tell kids you can't work in a group and come to a common knowledge and help each other learn? Because the teachers in us say, that's cheating. And we have our Western culture, what it is. But that's not how life's working. Questions, observations, disagreements. <laughs> and she's biting her tongue. Her <laughs> okay. Um, I guess, I guess what I would say in response to that is they have to learn basics to be able to participate in the group in a meaningful way. Now that's a teacher answer. Okay. <laughs> and a mama answer. Okay, I'm gonna give you uh, four Western virtues that are either anti-biblical or not in the Bible at all. And the first one, ironically, <laughs> is self-sufficiency. We tend to have less respect for someone who was born with a silver spoon in their mouth. And this is one of my favorite songs from the Vietnam War era. And it's called uh, Favorite Son. And it's by Creed and Clearwater Revival, Revival. And it says, some folks are born to made to wave the flag. Some folks are born made to wave the flag. Oh, they're red, white, and blue. And when the band plays Hail to the Chief, Ooh, they point the cannon at you. And he says, it ain't me, it ain't me, I ain't no senator's son. It ain't me, it ain't me, I ain't no fortunate one. Now, second verse, some folks are born silver spoon in hand. Lord, they don't know help, they don't help themselves. No, but when the tax man come to the door, Lord, the house looking like a rummage sale. Now, <clears throat> Do we have that kind of saying? Do we have that kind of thought? Do we kind of look down on people that just automatically have it made? They're born with that silver spoon in their mouth? Be honest. Yeah, we do. Sometimes it's envy. I don't know that it's looking down on it, but I wish it was that easy for coveting. Me. Yeah, coveting. Mm -hmm. We have a problem with it anyway. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> of course, what does the Bible tell us about boasting about tomorrow? 
You don't know guarantees. You don't know guarantees. Don't, no, don't guarantees, guarantees for the No guarantees, for example. The second example is fighting for freedom. Isn't that what we believe? Mm -hmm. Isn't that why we're supporting Ukraine? Mm -hmm. Isn't that every John Wayne movie ever made? We, we're supposed to fight for freedom. Is, did Jesus fight for freedom? Yeah. Yeah. Freedom from sin, maybe. Mm -hmm. And he for fight? a new way. Mm -hmm. Was he against? Was he against the Roman? Did he tell his people to join the resistance? Mm -hmm. Did he tell them to withhold their money? He only said to give Caesar what is due mm -hmm. Caesar. <laughs> he got pretty upset at the temple when they were using it for other than what God intended it for to be used for. But he wasn't backing that idea that he was come to defeat the Roman Empire. No. So he didn't, he didn't fight for those kind of things. In fact, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 39 and 40 and 41, he says, Do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you in the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. He wasn't about fighting back. Um, in light of the time, I'm going to go to the third example. Um, how would you rather be recognized as a follower or a leader? What does a follower connotate and what does a leader connotate? Leaders strong, followers weak. Mm -hmm. Okay, leaders strong, followers are weak. Leaders are probably creative, and the followers are kind of mindless, or else they'd be the creative ones. We have all kinds of negative connotations applied to the two of them. Um, Do we, boy, I have to be careful standing up here saying this. In the church, do we follow that same pattern of looking for leaders and followers? Well, we're all encouraged to be followers of Jesus, for sure. Followers of Jesus. I mean, that does not mean weakness. I'm talking about uh, you know, church people. Church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People. Well, usually you're on that you're on the lookout for individuals that already dem already demonstrate that they have leadership qualities even if even when they're young and then you, you want to uh, help them foster more growth in that in that leadership what do we do with our language right now in the church when we talk about things like that we don't want to say, oh, you're a drone. You're mm -hmm. a follower. Oh, you're a leader. What we say is, we are all what? Servant leaders. Mm -hmm. Because that's another euphemism to help us get away from that tension between leader and follower. Mm -hmm. You can be a servant leader. That doesn't mean that doesn't place you above anybody. You're the same as any as the servant follower. So we hyphenate it and, and we take that away because we have tension with those kind of concepts. Um, the fourth one, four minutes. Tolerance. What do we hear about tolerance in America? Is it okay for us to say at the Grammys there was a song called Unholy and it was all about satanic things? And we just say, well, that's okay. We're supposed to be tolerant. Think of all the other things that we're supposed to tolerate in our society. Is toler being tolerant? A virtue. 
Well, this is something we talked about in our small group a couple of weeks ago is like, we kind of skewed the meaning of what tolerance actually is. Like in today's modern American society, tolerance is like, okay, we're just gonna accept whatever, but really tolerance means you fundamentally disagree with something and you're not gonna stand for it, even if you might let it be. I don't think I'm explaining it very well, but you get what I'm saying, right? You may not go beat the person up because you disagree with them. Right. But you're not going to act like you're okay with it, which is what tolerance is today. Like you tolerate the person, but not right. the behavior. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like we, the example Jesus gave. He always met everybody that he met where they were, whether they were a woman caught in adultery or a exactly. woman at the well that was living somebody she wasn't married to, he he accepted them for wh where they were, but he didn't offer them a chance to stay there. He offered them something better and and encouraged them to go That's not right. feeling condemned, but don't sin anymore. Yeah. So he made them, made, made them aware of what was sin. And, and that's the difference. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. the difference. And that gets back to what we were talking about earlier with the psalmist saying that he has to learn to live a godly life. Mm -hmm. A godly life isn't something that you just put on. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you practice it every day. You live it every day until it becomes second nature for you to do that and be that. And that's when the tolerance is going to be a little easier for us to deal with. You got to count the cost. Yeah, what? You got to count the cost and see. Well, this isn't where I want. This is not where I want wanted to be at the end. But I'd rather be here than way up where to where I couldn't handle something. <clears throat> One last thing. I get two minutes. But you're right. We have to count the cost. What? What's it worth to get to a post? Um, you know the the. Uh, Scripture about the uh, rich man who uh, had an abundance of possessions. And what did he do? He built another storage. What was, what was wrong with that? God called him a fool. Why? But then he's saying you can't take it with you pretty much in so many words. Yeah. This sure. is temporary. Instead of using it. He was assuming that he would be there. Okay. Yeah. Now I want you to read this stone, read it. I know the bell's gonna ring. When Jesus told this parable, did he denounce the man for having for working hard to fill his barns? What was he observing? It's not bad to have it. What was he really saying? No, to depend on it. What? To depend on it. No. He was, he was getting after him because he wasn't willing to share. Mm -hmm. He was hoarding it mm -hmm. for himself. To read the story again. And he wasn't sharing it. He collected it and collected it. He was going to collect it. And there were people all around him that had nothing. And he did not. He was not planning to, to share it. Um, it's selfishness. Now, in that, he said, um, last verse, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. What does it mean to be rich toward God? What does it look like? I can tell you what I have down. We'll end it. Since it's eight o'clock. To give. Um, to share. You have to be thankful to God for your blessings. Two means a stewardship. You need to return God's portion to God. And thirdly, it must mean generosity toward the neighbor whom Jesus is charged to love, but he did in Luke, and to our enemy who Jesus also charged us to love. And these are all going to be part of our lesson on Sunday. Sunday, I'm going to study Luke. Um, 
He says, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Now, <clears throat> I will mention this one last thing. I had part of the, more part of the lesson just in case I needed it. If you look at the two books of Timothy and Titus, they were actually between two epiphanies. Those people at the time were aware of, of Jesus' return to the earth. He died. He came back. He made himself present to those people. And they were aware that there's going to be another thing. And those two books, Timothy and Titus, are where you're going to find the majority of all those lists of the virtues and the vices. Remember the list? You know, you may have four. And then the fifth one, you have know, your summary. So <clears throat> you might go back and read Timothy and Titus and that's where you're gonna find this list of virtues and vices. We tend to take those lists as a Western culture and categorize them. We tend to change them as we need to do. And that's not what the Bible tells us to do if we're gonna live a God of life. So we need to think about that a little bit. Questions, Satan's. Between a rock and a hard place. Yeah, it is a rock and a hard place, actually. It's a hard thing to do. The sad, you know what the sad thing is? When you're 16 and 17, you say, Oh, I love Jesus, everything's great. It's it's when you're like me when you're 75 or 76. That yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pretty you, soon, it's not long. You <laughs> sit around and you say, I should have been doing all this all my life. Yeah. I should have been doing this, and I would be a much better person now than I am. I promise. So it's, that's the sad thing. If you're going to do anything, go grab a young person and say, I'm going to teach you something. 